as we age, as we age, maintaining bone health and preventing falls becomes critical. Hello, I'm the host Alice, and joining us today is Dr. Deborah Cato, a renowned ger- geriatric specialist and co-director of the Stanford Long- Longevity Center, to shed light on this essential topic. So, welcome to our show, Dr. Cato. How is everything going today? Thank you so much, Alice, um, for your kind welcome, and uh, it's it's going well. Okay, so Dr. Kato, could you delve into your latest research trends? Uh, what's on the horizon for reducing the risk of recurrent falls among seniors, in your opinion? Well, what is on the horizon is the fact that our population is um, rapidly getting into the age group of 65 and older. In terms of the research that has been going on to reduce falls, that has been going on um, for probably longer than you have been alive. So uh, we have multiple randomized controlled trials, which are considered um, the gold standard evidence to show whether an intervention works or may not work. And um, fortunately, we have multiple trials in the area of fall prevention um, that have been endorsed and repeated in multiple uh, populations at risk for falling. So older adults over the age of 65, for example, um, and the best interventions uh, have been in general exercise interventions uh, to reduce the risk of falls. And generally these interventions have been maybe one hour three times a week for uh, anywhere from three months to a year and have uh, reduced the risk of falling substantially. Um, One particular type of exercise that has been replicated in multiple trials has been uh, the practice of Tai Chi. And if you have um, seen any videos or been fortunate enough to visit China, for example, that's a very popular activity to do in in the community. And as a practicing um, osteoporosis doctor and geriatric specialist, when um, people who have been born in China come to see me, Uh, and they're concerned about, say, a very low bone density that they get on the screening bone density scan called DEXA, they they are actually able to squat down to the floor and get up without their use of the arms, which I would have to say many of my Western counterparts uh, in terms of patients who are of the similar age um, are worried even to get down to the floor because they might not be able to get out up without assistance. So um, certainly the um, fall prevention in terms of balance exercises and keeping active is the key thing. So that's not new. That's just that people are unaware. But when I say horizon, I think now that more and more people are crossing that threshold of age 65, they're becoming more aware of what the implications of a fall might mean. So falls are very common over the age of 65, maybe one in three in Canada or in the United States will report having a fall in a year, and about five in a hundred will have a pretty serious injury as a result to that fall. And one of the things people really worry about are hip fractures. So I think on the horizon, what needs to happen is an increased awareness of this problem that can be prevented. So you did mention Tai Chi being one of the exercise routines that's really beneficial. I'm curious about what other exercise or maybe even dietary advice you could give. Sure, sure. So Tai Chi has been replicated multiple times, but it's really this idea of being present in one's own body. Um, and uh, I sometimes have patients come and tell me, well, I'm just clumsy. So I, you know, I trip and fall all the time. Well, the truth of the matter is now, if you do that, there could be worse um, consequences that could be long lasting. So don't, don't accept yourself as being clumsy, like don't be clumsy, (laughs) live in the moment, think of where you are, and uh, be aware of your environment. And what I didn't mention in the just previously is that while I said the exercise trials are the most effective, there's certain things like what the environment looks like, what your home environment looks like, your outside environment. So, you know, in um, the East Coast, where you are, where it snows, uh, one will have to be more careful uh, when the snow turns to black ice, and 
then you're much more likely to fall. So environmental factors, when people pay attention to the environmental factors, that will reduce the risk of falls. Um, the number of medication one takes, there's certain types of medications that are associated with increased risk of falls and fractures. So to discuss with your physician, what are the things that you can do to decrease your risk of falls um, besides just the exercise um, is important. Um, and when I say about being aware of one's self, uh, body, uh, somebody's space in, um, in um, trying, besides Tai Chi, just when you stand up, for example, um, are you standing with your feet further apart or closer together? And if they're further apart, may, maybe try to adjust your feet to be closer together. And if that, you notice your balance kind of being off, that means you may need extra uh, certain uh, instructions on how to improve your balance or just even standing on one leg, is that possible? And practicing those types of um, challenges to balance. So athletes, for example, get knocked over all the time, but they learn how to fall. And so um, older adults can similarly do that. So it's kind of a multifactorial approach. And if someone is unsure, has never done this, is clumsy, that's the time to think about, well, maybe I need to see an expert, such as a physical therapist, to help me get on a program to improve my balance to decrease falls. So you also asked about diet. So diet is a very important um, factor as well to consider. Um, and I think that um, what has been shown in multiple kind of large studies, just observing what people do and what they eat and how they do health-wise, um, I think there is pretty much a consensus across the world that fresh fruits and fresh the vegetables on a daily basis um, are very healthy and um, really maximizing non-processed foods. So those are the types of foods that don't live on your shelf uh, for more than, you know, <laughs> a few months as opposed to a couple of years. Um, and also uh, a varied diet of a variety of different fruits and vegetables um, are good. And olive oil also seems to be uh, a great, um, a great uh, dietary uh, kind of uh, food to focus on in terms of oils, uh, the Mediterranean diet, I'm sure you've probably heard about. Uh, it's amazing, though, for example, in Costa Rica, it's not known for its high economic, um, you know, wealth, and yet uh, they have made it work in terms of making, uh, taking advantage of the local fruits and vegetables that are, are present in their environment. But for someone, say, living in an urban area, um, and it's hard to get to the store because it's snowy outside and the weather prohibits getting there or transportation, whatever. Um, uh, frozen, a uh, flash, uh, frozen food, uh, fruits and vegetables do tend to maintain the nutrients that um, scientists view are uh, as important, as opposed to say uh, canned um, or jarred uh, fruits and vegetables that tend to be preserved with a lot of sodium and things like that. So um, frozen, okay, if you have access to a freezer, and sometimes those are just not as expensive either. The other thing to bring up um, is some of the research that I've done has been in the gut microbiome, and I do want to give a special shout out to fermented foods, and a lot of cultures do depend on fermented foods for precisely what you've said, and those can be very, very healthy for the gut microbiome. So for instance, sauerkraut to kimchi to uh, what they call natto or uh, fermented soybeans, uh, so all over the world, pickles, et cetera. You have mentioned a few times now about your focus on osteoporosis, and I've also read that in 2007, you even defined hypercophosis, I hope I read that right, as a new geriatric term. So I was just a little bit curious about that. Could you tell me a little bit about it? Oh, yes. So hyperkyphosis um, refers to the increased um, upper spine curvature that tends to get more pronounced as people age. And uh, prior to embarking in, in this area, it had been called commonly the dowager's hump, which was a term uh, coined in the uh, UK in about 1944. 
uh, and they even called it a widow's hump. Uh, and, and most people had thought it was due to underlying osteoporosis and vertebral fractures. But research that I did when I was a younger uh, postdoctoral fellow at UCSF, uh, where I had access to about 10,000 x-rays of older women starting at age 65, was able to kind of show that um, that uh, um, this forward curvature was not necessarily due to just underlying uh, osteoporosis and vertebral fractures, but other things such as decreased muscle strength, um, degenerative disc disease, even as there was a suggestion of an underlying genetic component so that if your parent had more pronounced um, kyphosis as they got older, you would also be more likely to do that. Um, so uh, yes, so we looked at some of the causes. We also were able to show that uh, people who suffer from this type of posture would be more likely to develop worsening physical function over time, including an increased risk of falls, fractures, and even earlier mortality. So in about 2014 or so I collaborated with uh, Dr. Wendy Katzman, a physical therapist professor at UCSF, and we did some intervention studies that look specifically at postural uh, strengthening by back extensor strengthening exercises, as well as awareness, and we're able to show a decline, meaning uh, in the progression. So people were actually able to improve their posture, just working specifically on the, the core strength and the spinal extensor strength. Uh, so thank you for asking. Yeah, that's how I kind of first uh, kind of continued in my academic role in research. Uh, oh, yes, that's amazing. Um, so you said that posture can help people in terms of um, their like progress in kyphosis. Would you say that it's also helpful for like ordinary people who don't have those sorts of issues just in terms of posture, um, in terms of aging? Oh, yeah, I think, I think when your mother told you to stand up straight, uh, <laughs> there was some wisdom to that. Also, the old adage, use it or lose it, uh, for sure are really important things to think about. Uh, there's so much about posture that um, says something about a person, and maybe even particularly as they get older, that if you can stand up straight and be erect, it kind of commands a presence and old elders should be respected for all their life experiences and the fact that they survived through them and are existing into this older age age group. Um, but that being said, even younger people, right? If they if they hold themselves kind of like this, it sends a totally different message. So I think uh, posture is probably underrated. We don't think about it. Um, and probably now for the rest of the show, I'm going to be sitting up straight. <laughs> <laughs> oh, well, thank you so much for that enlightening conversation on bone health. Um, are there any key messages that you would like our viewers to take to heart? And is there any particular action you would like to inspire them to undertake? Sure. So I think uh, one thing for the audience to consider is that sometimes um, we don't feel like we have a lot of power, but in fact, our mind is extremely powerful. So there have been a lot of um, researchers who have looked at mindset and making a determination of what somebody wants to do and being able to achieve that goal. As a geriatrician, we really focus on what we call what matters um, and understanding and being able to develop goals. So for instance, I will ask my patients in the 90s, what are, so what are your, some of your goals for today? And I, I'd say half the time I get laughs, like what goals? And I, and I encourage the audience to really think about what your goals are and not to think that just because I'm a certain age or of a certain infirmity, meaning I have disabilities in one area or the other, that you can't improve. Because, in fact, studies show that, um, particularly at an old age, if you make a change in your behavior, you have a goal, that you will be more likely to achieve it and enjoy a good success. So I guess that's what I would leave um, this audience with, that you have the power to, to make those decisions that are going to result in positive outcomes, but you have to believe it and you have to do the work. Oh, yes, that's a really powerful message. I'm really glad that you were able to share that with the audience. Um, 
when did you start uh, thinking this way about this sort of thing? Like, has that always been a mindset that you've had? So and probably my patients um, over my medical training um, helped me realize that. They taught me a lot. Oh, yeah, that's lovely. I'm so glad that you were able to think that way. And I hope the audience can gain something from it as well. Thank you so much for joining us today, Dr. Kato. Here's to aging gracefully and staying forever young. <laughs>